uh, but also more to uh, a discussion of the ideologies uh, of uh, the mid 19th century. Uh, each of these is obviously deserving of uh, you know very substantial consideration. Uh, things like socialism, liberalism, nationalism, uh, all of which really come to the fore uh, in the mid 19th century. But but we just want to take a, a, a brief look at that and, and, and try to spend a little bit of time on uh, the principal reading that you had uh, in relation to uh, in relationship to that particular uh, set of questions, and that is uh, the Communist Manifesto. And I had sent an email out to the class uh, about that uh, uh, yesterday. So uh, in my closing remarks to you on uh, Friday, I have been speaking to you about the census. Uh, the census is one of those technologies which really comes about in the 19th century. This is not to say that states were not interested in collecting information about people before they did. Uh, I, I know from my study of India that the Mughal Empire, for example, had something that might be described as a rudimentary kind of census. Uh, and obviously, there were ways in which uh, states were very often able to assess uh, the demography, right? Uh, so what is the population of Paris, for example, in 1800, or of London in 1750? And, and sometimes in my remarks, I have conveyed to you some round numbers. Uh, well, how do we know these numbers? Because, because the because the idea of the state uh, is something that obviously, and a state which which is collecting statistics. By the way, the words statistics and state are etymologically related. For those of you who study statistics, because one of the functions of a state, in fact, is to collect statistics. All right. So, uh, 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 for example, when you, think, when you look at such things as revenue collection, this was one of the ways in which states were able to gather information about people. But the census is a, uh, is a different kind of enterprise. It's not only different because it's much more <laughs> thorough, much more thorough. Most countries today have a census. Uh, when they do not have a census, it is almost always because of political reasons. So for example, in Pakistan, uh, they have not had a census for several decades. Uh, one of my TAs for the class, Madonna, was telling me that in Lebanon, they haven't had a census since 1932, I think. Right? Now, why don't they have a census in some of these places? So in Pakistan, for example, if they had a census, uh, one of the things that the census might show is that uh, the Shia population, for example, I'm just giving a hypothesis here, right, is larger than what one had expected. Or the state fears that the census is going to reveal some information which could be used by a group to mobilize itself. Right? So what I'm, what I'm very simply suggesting here is that the census, and that was in fact my concluding remark for you on Friday, contrary to the common received opinion, and the common received opinion is that the census simply captures a social reality out there. It tells us how many men and women there are in the population, what percentage of the population is Christian or Buddhist or Hindu, what is the level of education. And yes, indeed, it may do all of that. I'm not suggesting that it may not be doing that, but it may also actually be creating that reality. Now, let me give you two different illustrations, both from the realm of religion. And, and I'm, I'm dwelling on this merely as an illustration because we could take any one of these technologies of the state and elaborate upon it in a similar fashion. So what are the two instances I want to give to you? One is from Japan, where uh, a number of studies have been done, uh, most recently by, by the Pew Religious Study Center. What the Pew's, uh, Pew is a, a group that, that does these uh, massive surveys uh, of such things as religion, uh, you know, human rights, so forth and so on. Right? Now, uh, they, asked in, uh, they asked people in Japan, uh, what, is your, uh, what is your religion? And 75 or 80% of the people said Shintoism, and about the same number said Buddhism. Now, that's not really possible, right? Because everything should add up to 100%. So 20% of the population says they're Shinto, 50 says they're Buddhist, 10 says they're Christian, and you know, it should all add up to 100. Well, this adds up to 155, and this is, and this doesn't include people who are obviously <laughs> claiming to be adherents of another religion. Well, the reason for that is quite simple, that people do not necessarily think that they have an exclusive religious identity. 
those who are calling themselves Shinto might also call themselves Buddhist at the same time. However, what the census will typically do is it'll say, which is your religion? Check one box. Check one box. Right? And they might give you a choice of 10 or 15. And in India, quite similarly, and here the case is more complicated for the simple reason that you could argue that Shintoism and Buddhism have a lot of affinity. Right? They're, they're relatively close to each other in some ways. Well, Hinduism and Islam are not really close to each other in that sense of the term, not even remotely. Uh, this is a kind of a cliche phrase that I mention every time, but because I have a different group of students, so you haven't, you haven't heard this, uh, but it's one, one simple way to express to you what the colonial state in India thought about Hinduism and Islam. And they said these religions are so different, the best way we can understand it is that the Hindu loves to worship the cow, the Muslim loves to eat the cow. Right? And that's how different they are. Now in India, when they, did, when they started doing the census, and they said, well, check off one box. Well, there are people who said, well, we can't check off one box because we think we're Hindu, we're Muslim, and we may need to be something else. People who, who come from tribal religions, I'm using that word in tentatively in quotation marks, uh, because I don't want to set up a hierarchy between the so-called world religions, such as Christianity and Islam, and then these things called tribal religions. Right? But uh, simply to indicate to you that groups that are viewed as pagan or animist, whatever, however you wish to describe them, now, if you speak to people of these, these groups, and in India, even today, roughly 200 million people, at least 200 million people come from what, you, what is called a tribal background. Right? And if you speak to them, many of them will tell you that even after they've converted to Christianity, so conversion to Christianity or Islam is not uncommon, they will tell you, <coughs> that they actually will take part in the religious festivals of a number of different religions. So for example, a, a maid that we had at our home in, in Delhi some years ago when I was when I had relocated for a couple of years to live back in India, you know, I was having a conversation with her, and it turns out, well, that she's from a place called Jharkhand. She, she was following a, a, a tribal religion. And it turns out that she thinks of herself not simply as a follower of that tribal religion, but she also thinks of herself as a Hindu and a Christian. And my own way of putting it is that it's actually very smart. She has a triple life insurance policy because first she prays to the tribal god if something goes wrong. And it turns out, well, the tribal god is not responsive. So then she prays to the Hindu god. Uh, yeah, you know, no luck there. Well, let me pray to the Christian god. Let's see if that works. This is how they think of religion. They don't compartmentalize it. But it has to be this exclusive religious identity. What the census was doing was it was creating identities, not simply documenting them. And very often, it was creating exclusive identities, which is a very modern way of thinking about oneself. So this is what I mean when I speak of technologies of the state, that the, this is not an innocent enterprise, not even remotely. The notion of a census is not what it does, of course, and I'm not speaking about all of its other aspects. I would remind you of that slide I'd shown you, these kind of mug shots right, of these indentured laborers, and each of them is given a number. They simply become a number. Right? So how did we become so enamored of these kinds of numbers, thinking of the world through numbers in this sense. And a colleague of mine wrote a wonderful book, uh, Ted Porter, called Trust in Numbers. Right? That at this point in time, at this juncture, 19th century, we begin to have, with the active encouragement of the state, what we might describe as a trust in numbers. And a trust in numbers means that we begin to, in, in a sense, also believe the kind of social science that is being produced by the state, by the state, right? So when I speak of technologies of the state, now if you just look through this very briefly, so it's, again, bear in mind, I'm not saying that you didn't have police services in the 18th century, in the 17th century, but 
the manner in which police services are going to be organized, right? The centralization of these police services. And then, of course, the fact that they are going to be given the tools of modern technology, modern surveillance. We are living, whether you like it or not, whether you, whether you want to even remotely admit this to yourself or not, you are living in a surveillance state. You know. and, you, and it's not just you in the United States. Almost everyone is living in a surveillance state to some degree or the other. And one of the reasons why people, in fact, actually migrate very often right, is because they want to escape to an area that is not under surveillance. That is not under surveillance. There's an, anth there's an anthropologist at Yale University who has this whole theory, uh, James Scott, an extraordinary scholar, who has this whole theory about how people tend to move away from agricultural civilizations where there is a, a lot more surveillance to non-agricultural civilizations. So he's trying to understand the whole development of Southeast Asia. The, the category you might want to use, which is the one that he uses, is he makes a distinction between state spaces, state spaces, and non-state spaces, right? Non-state spaces. Uh, because one of the things that's happening here is, of course, such things as the fact that borders are being much more tightly regulated now. I mean, in the 19th century, we are nowhere near where we are today with, terms, with, with respect to the question of regulation of borders <laughs> and so forth and so on. And of course, in order to enforce borders, you need a whole kind of paraphernalia. That paraphernalia includes such things as the passport. Right? When did the passport come into existence? Do you think that people who are traveling to the United States, migrating to the US, uh, the Puritans in the 1600s, that they were traveling with a passport? Of course not. Nobody was traveling with a passport in 1800. It's a very modern kind of social document. <coughs> and now, of course, life is inconceivable if you want to cross borders right, without a passport. So if you do the social history of the passport, you begin to understand how the state is gradually acquiring powers which it never did. Because who has the authority to issue a power, which is the issuing authority. It's the state. It's an agency of the state. UCLA cannot issue a passport and, and have it, and you can't expect that you're gonna have any luck being able to travel to a country. Of course not, because that's not a responsible, legitimate authority. Right? This is what I mean when I speak about technologies of the state. This is what is fundamentally happening in the 19th century. You're having a massive expansion of bureaucracy. I've given you the numbers for Japan under the Meiji Restoration in the late 19th century. Similar things are happening, of course, in a great many other places, such as India, in Britain itself. And, and in the colonial situation, there are all kinds of interesting questions which we really cannot explore, because one of the extraordinary aspects of British colonialism in India was that the colonial state in India was far more developed than the state in England itself in some respects. So actually, the British took back what they had developed in India, some of these technologies of the state. They first developed them in India to rule a subject people. And that's why it's perhaps not altogether surprising, because you do want to develop more complex technologies of the state when you have a population that is potentially an insurgent, right, subordinate population that might rebel against you. And so the British developed a police service which was far more complicated in India than they had one in London. And then in 1900, the, the, high commi the commissioner of police that they're going to appoint in London is a man who had spent his adult career in India. Right, so there, there are these aspects of that story. About, about how, in fact, you can take some of these technologies from the colonies and then go back and use them in the metropolitan area. Civil services, the Indian civil service. The British established what was called the Indian civil service. If you are representing the United States as a diplomat today for the last 50 years, 60, 70 years, well, you have to be a member of the United States Foreign Service. That's a part of a bureaucracy. And then, of course, the question is, well, how do these bureaucracies come into existence? And, and this is not simply a matter of looking at jobs and employment. 
we have to think of it as what I'm describing as technologies of the state. So the word technology here simply does not refer to technology in the modern sense, uh, in which many people very often think of technologies when they think of you know iPhones, well, that's a technology, or the railways is a form of technology, so forth and so on. There are other kinds of technologies which, in fact, are coming into place in the 19th century. Uh, and if we went through each of these, we would see that there is an extraordinary paraphernalia uh, of surveillance, of regimentation, of enumeration, of enumeration. So let me put the proposition to you before I move to the other segment of the story about technologies. Let me put the proposition to you in this way, that in some countries in the 19th century, they are moving from a fuzzy word, fuzzy. Fuzzy is clouded. A word of ambiguity, a word where boundaries and borders have not been set from a fuzzy word to a bounded word, where your identity is bounded, it's constrained. And this is one of the reasons why one of the social groups everywhere in Europe that causes a huge amount of anxiety to every European country you know what group I'm talking about? The gypsies. The gypsies. By the way, in England, the gypsies are known officially as the travelers. And that's actually how they're referred to, as the travelers. So what, what, is, what is the extraordinary thing about the gypsies? The fact that they refuse to be bounded. They refuse to be domesticated. You know what gypsies typically do? They come to a place, they put up a tent for a few weeks, and Next morning, overnight, they've gone. They've gone somewhere else. They do not respect borders of states. And that is one reason why there is such enormous anxiety in every European country. If you look at the official policies of Romania, Hungary, even France, you know, about the gypsies, you would understand why they have so much anxiety. Because these are people who cannot be documented. They cannot be put under surveillance. That's one reason why undocumented workers, as they're called here, or undocumented students, and so on, fill this administration with so much anxiety. One of many reasons. So because these are people who are, these gypsies are people who are evading the dragon neck of the state. That's what they're doing. And they don't, they, and of course, that when a crime takes place, you know, they become the scapegoats. I mean, in France, anytime you have a, a social problem, they'll try to pin it either on the immigrants or on the gypsies. That is very commonly done. But this is what the gypsies are. They represent a group of people who transgress the kinds of ideas, not just the orders. They transgress the kind of ideas that were starting to become dominant in the 19th century. But I do want to look at the same time at the other aspect of technology, the one that you're more familiar with, except that I picked two things which we wouldn't, wouldn't ordinarily pick. Right? I mean, uh, of course, I mean, I have spoken about the railways, but I thought I would look very briefly at the machine gun. There's a, there's a wonderful book, and I gave you just about 10, 15 pages from this book, Social <laughs> History of the Machine Gun. Because, of course, this is one way to start thinking about military technology. Right? Uh, and if you read those 10, 15 pages, the first and most obvious thing that emerges from that, and it stares you in the face today if you think about, for example, what's happening in the Palestinian territories. Whatever your politics, okay? whatever your view about what's happening there, what you, whether you think Israel's on the right side, or the Palestinians are, or that it's a big muddle that you don't really know. Most people would say that, well, look, we can't really decide, right? Whatever the politics, leave that aside for a moment. You cannot deny the fact that there is an extraordinary asymmetry between the state of Israel and the Palestinians. What is the most evident image of what is called the Intifada? Right? Uh, we're, this is not the first intifada now. We're, we're in the second or third or fourth, depending on how you count it. But what was it? The state of Israel using airplanes to bomb 
Palestinian villages. And what are the Palestinian youth doing? They're throwing rocks. That's the asymmetry of power that you're speaking about between the state of Israel and the Palestinians. Now, what is the asymmetry of power here in, when you read the history of the machine gun, the soldier history of the machine gun? That's exactly what we're speaking about over here. If you look at this passage, for example, all right, this is, I'm just going to read it out. The Mashonas were Lovengula's subjects, it's talking about this is an African group there, right? And the white men had no business with the Mashonas to protect them or shield them from the king's justice. So if these had to be sent to punish these Mashonas, and they had collided with the white man. And the white man came again with his guns that spat bullets, as the heavens sometimes spit hail. And who were the naked Matabele to stand up against those guns? And these guys are throwing spears. And the British, they go to a little hillock, a little mound, they set up a couple of these machine guns, and they just bow down. Just bow down people. I mean, you, the asymmetry, you read the numbers in these wars, colonial wars in Africa, you know, 10,000 people are being killed on the indigenous side, and maybe at one or two Englishmen are being killed. And you see the same as asymmetry of power when you have drone attacks, or when you have attacks from the air today. <laughs> so th this is this is what is transpiring in the mid 19th century. See, and this is a new development in military history. It's a new development. If you if you look at the technology of the army now, I'm using technology in the former sense. That is, how are armies organized, right? How do they conduct warfare? And if you were a military historian, you would track this over a long period of time. You know, what happens when you have mobile artillery? The mobile artillery is you're on horseback. Uh, the Uzbeks, uh, for example, were, were able to use mobile artillery. In the 15th, 16th century, if you look at the Mughal conquests, uh, and then if you look at the Mughal and Babur's invasion uh, of India, uh, 1520s, uh, the use of mobile artillery. So you're on horseback, you've got, uh, uh, you know, artillery which is small, and you're able to fire it from the horse itself while you're on horseback. Now that's an improvement. Right? So we could, track, we could track all of these improvements over a very <coughs> long period of time. However, what is distinct about the 19th century, about the mid 19th century, that's when you can first begin to see this. There was never that kind of asymmetry between warring factions. There never was, not to that extent. Very often, military battles, wars may be decided by the fact, apart from the fact that one side may have superior numbers, they may have a better organized army, they may have more efficient leadership, so forth and so on. But notwithstanding all those differences, generally what you find is that both sides are roughly equivalent in terms of military technology. There may be some difference. It may not be astronomical, though. So if you read Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, the, uh, the, the, this, the battle between the long, drawn-out battle between the Athenians and the Spartans, right? this is not being decided by military technology, fundamentally. And even if it is, you do not have that kind of asymmetry. In the mid-19th century, this asymmetry develops. And we continue to see that down to the present day. I just read in the New York Times three or four days ago that the Chinese have now launched their second aircraft war, uh, carrier. But their aircraft carriers are, the first one was a old Soviet ship. You know, and they basically refurbish it, it takes about 10 years. Their aircraft carrier, the one they have now, is not even equivalent to the one that the Americans produced 30 years ago, 30 years ago. Forget about the nuclear powered aircraft carriers that the US has, which there's no match for that anywhere in the world, not even remotely. So I don't understand why, why the administrations keep on saying for so many years that you know we are lagging behind 
if the military is not being funded properly, let's put on another 15 billion bucks because frankly, everybody here is doing so well in this society that we don't need to worry about the poor and the wretched and so forth and so on, right? The asymmetry is extraordinary. But I gave you the example of the Palestinians, I gave you a political example there, right? Uh, in, which is in a different fashion than, than between what's happening between the US and China. So this is really what that reading is fundamentally about. But then, of course, there are other implications we have to think about. And, those, and even those 10, 15 pages that I uh, <coughs> assigned to you make clear what those implications were. Namely, if there is this huge technological gap, does this mean that this te technological gap reflects a moral gap? Does this mean that the Americans are, because they're technologically superior, that they're a superior race? And what John Ellis is saying in the social history of machine gun is that that was in fact the British view. The Europeans had superior military technology because frankly, they were a superior race, right? And that this technological gap was necessary why? It was necessary because, in fact, it enabled the spread of real civilization. Right? Now, how else is going, a civilization going to civilize others if you don't have that gap? Right? You have to have the savage, as it were, if you're going to be having a civilizing mission. Right? And of course, in, in some cases, as he points out, you know, some of the writing can get a little bit lyrical. The savages were to be treated as they were described. In these writings, these are not my words. As I described in these writings, they were to be treated to a little bit of Gatling music. Gatling is the name of the machine gun, right? right? So the machine gun is going to spit these bullets, and it's like music. It's music to the ears of the Europeans, and it's music to them, too, because, well, they're going to learn to do a little dance, as it were. You know? they, so, so when we're speaking about this gap, we are speaking about many implications for social history, many implications for relations, interpersonal relations, not just between people, but relations between different social groups and between different countries. And, I, and I'm suggesting to you that when you look at the present day disputes that we have, uh, for example, uh, the whole dispute over uh, uh, Palestine, uh, that Something like this should should come to your mind. It's not simply a matter of saying, well, there were these peace accords, there's this Oslo peace process, run, <laughs> negotiations. That not, that's not going to give you the real cultural history of what is really implicated uh, in these kinds of uh, uh, interactions between Palestinians and the state of Israel, or other actors for that matter. And I'm not, for a moment, suggesting I haven't used that word, and I'm, I'm quite deliberate about it. I'm not for a moment suggesting that, that the Palestinians are innocent, or the Africans in the late 19th century here that were being worn down were, quote, innocent in some sense. I'm not making any statement of that kind, because then we'd have to look at the social history of these groups and their interactions with other social groups in that territory. But what is of fundamental concern to us here is the fact that this is what begins to emerge. Right? Two observations, namely, what begins to emerge in the 19th century is an extraordinary asymmetrical warfare. And secondly, the assumption that this actually reflected the gap between civilizations, that technology has a direct correspondence with civilization itself. And therefore, because the Europeans had the superior military technology, they were just, in fact, a very superior race. Right? And of course, I'm not even speaking here about things that are absolutely self-evident, such as the fact that racialism was just absolutely rampant. I mean, those 10, 15 pages that you read, it just reeks of it, right? The quotations that he has from these writings. And then, of course, the last implication, when we speak about asymmetrical warfare, how does a group of people respond to that? Well, one of the ways they respond to it is what you witnessed in Vietnam. 
Because again, Vietnam was an illustration of extraordinary asymmetrical power. I mean, the Americans are dropping napalm. That's not what the Viet Cong has. But what do they do? They use guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare. In other words, you, you essentially decide upon military strategies where you subvert the ordinary rules of warfare. The older armies, 14th, 15th, 16th century, whether in China or India or, or in Europe, you had two mass armies that would meet on the battlefield. And there would be certain protocols that would be followed. You know, in the Mahabharata, just to give you an idea that of how this works, uh, in the Mahabharata, which is, of course, this ancient Indian epic, I mean, there are passages where, you know, at the end of the day, after the two sides had fought with each other, the warriors had fought, you know, with each other, at the end of the day, they would get together and have drinks. There are certain norms. See, and all of, all of these are also going to disappear, completely disappear, when warfare becomes not just mechanized, but becomes a form of industrialized slaughter. Industrialized slaughter. You really see the industrialized slaughter when we move to World War I, but you're beginning to see a little bit of that already in the colonial wars fought by the Europeans in Africa. And the other technology, briefly, is lighting. As I said, not something that one would ordinarily think of, because what happens in Europe and the United States in the 19th century, middle part of the 19th century, is the streets suddenly become very well lit. Now, they had always been lighting before, but th that lighting was very laborious. And so you had gas lamps, for example. You would put gas lamps. And of course, the, the reach, the arc of light, the arc of light was relatively very small. Right? So if you read those, again, 15, 20 pages, that's all from this book by Schimmel Bush, who's a German social historian. You know, he talks about, which I didn't know that until I read this book, these, these light towers that were put up in places such as Paris, which would generate a huge amount of light, and the area that they would cover would be very substantial. Right? And, and then again, what you have to really do is you have to draw out the implications of this. And in fact, I would take Shivel Bush much further, much further, and I'm going to suggest how I'm going to do that in just a moment. Right? I mean, I think that the, to the extent to which, in fact, he does draw out some implications, he's absolutely right. So in 1845, uh, Michelet, Jules Michelet, wrote thus about gaslight in the new factories. Quote, these newly built big halls, flooded by brilliant light, torture eyes accustomed to darker quarters. I wonder how long it took human beings to get used to having light all the time. And you know, by the way, that, that you can do it in the, in the reverse sense, that one of the, one of the ways in which people are tortured is, uh, and, uh, is you try to do two things, all right? I'm not going to explain the second one in any length, because that's a subject for a book into itself, which no one has written. And that is how our sleep is being colonized, OK? How our sleep is being colonized. That's one of the things that's happening here. but. But with respect to lighting, one of the ways in which uh, people are tortured even down to the present day, uh, uh, you know, whether it's military interrogation of terrorists or uh, what's happening in Syria under Assad, or in, you put a person in jail and you leave the lights on 24 hours a day. You just leave them on all the time. You have these lights, right, focused on this person so they can't sleep. And, of, and, and this is this is what that second element there that 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 sleep is that last frontier of human civilization that the state and capitalism are going to try to colonize because you know you you're, you're a person who's living in a village in India Sudan Somalia you had a wretched day but you know generally the idea is okay now at night I've got those five six hours when I can sleep I don't have to worry about whether my crop is failing, whether my daughter has enough money to get married, whether my son is dying of cancer and I don't have money, you know, 
five, six hours, but no. How our sleep gets colonized. I mean, if you read about it in the 19th century, there's a whole literature on, on the fact that depriving slaves of their sleep was a critical element in keeping them in their place. Right? Ex extraordinary what is really going on here. But we don't want to shift away from that central focus, which is really on what I'm calling lighting. Right? So here there is no darkness, I'm continuing the quotation, into which thought can withdraw. Right? Now, when, when there's only lighting there, what happens to things like the contrast between light and darkness? What happens to the shadows, right? to the gray areas? Here there are no shadowy corners in which the imagination can indulge its dreams. No illusion is possible in this light. Incessantly, and no illusion is possible in this light. Right? What a wonderful idea, you know, right, to think about. Incessantly and mercilessly, it brings us back to reality. So when we're looking at the social history of lighting, very quickly, what do we have to consider? Right? Number one, that lighting at, on this scale, where street lighting is being introduced. All right? And now you're going to flood all the streets with light. Okay? This can only be done by the state. It can be done by the state. Number two, there was a demand for this. There was a demand for this because, of course, at night, if there's no light, certain groups are more vulnerable. A woman walking back home alone, and this is not necessarily a story of 1840. It could be a story of 2017 in many parts of the world. A woman walking back home alone at night is not very often safe. Now, that's what the, the, the whole idea of lighting was that, well, actually, <coughs> groups that have been social groups that are vulnerable may be slightly less vulnerable. The converse of this, of course, is that they are social groups that are active at night and do not want the light. They, these could be sex workers. These could be criminals, right? And so if you look at, the, if you look at when lighting is introduced, there's an, an interesting literature on how different social groups were receiving this whole idea of lighting. So we're talking about this, we're talking about the state. We're talking about the fact that the state is able to now bring in certain kinds of changes. We're talking about the relationship between lighting and surveillance. We're talking about the fact that different social groups have a different view about lighting. But on the whole, of course, the idea was that, well, it's, it's, it's it's good because it makes the street safe at night, right? So forth and so on. But I'm suggesting to you that there are obviously certain kinds of complexities if you try to do the social history of lighting and what was transpiring. And then you move to the move to the more intellectual realm, the quotation that I read out by Jules Michelet, you know, well what really what really are the long term implications? Uh, do we do we cease to be able to think with respect to the many questions, do we cease to be able to think with a certain degree of ambiguity and ambivalence? Right? What happens to notions such as ambiguity and ambivalence uh, when we are no longer able to draw the contrast between what light and dark? Right? This is, I think, what makes this discussion of lighting uh, the implications of it particularly interesting for us to really think about. And I'm not really going to go over the, the, the details of, of that reading because those, I think, are fairly self-evident. How did it start? You know, these light towers, uh, so forth and so on, and what particular kind of technology uh, did they really uh, deploy? Right? But if you have to think of it in a broader sense, you can think about lighting also in relationship to, let's say, public morals. And of course, the element that I've not explicitly mentioned, I've hinted at it, the last comment here, namely the fact that if there was a demand for it, we have to think again about what I've described in previous lectures as some notion of common good, right? That the middle class, because who is going to pay for this light? Just like who's going to pay for the public schools, who's going to pay for the public libraries, right? This is going to come out of the revenues that are generated by the state. These are middle class demands. Right? And this is what the middle class in the 19th century was doing. It was not simply a group of people who were consuming. Right? 
in, in India, when I go to India and I think of the middle class, I simply think of a class that's a class that's interested in consumption. No sense of social responsibility. In the 19th century, the, the middle class was not simply driving up consumption. It was, unquestionably. And it's continued to do that. It was also a class in countries such as the United States and Britain, Germany. And when I say Germany, I don't mean Germany as a state, because in Germany it wasn't unified until later. Right? But I'm talking about the separate German states, you know, uh, France. In all of these places, the middle class was a class that was invested in the notion of some kind of common social goods. But you know, a certain certain investment by the state may not benefit us personally, but it benefits the wider social group. And therefore, it's perfectly fine for us to be able to, to for us to pay for that. All right. So this is this is what. I am describing very broadly as a whole question of technologies. Now, mid-19th century, we have a number of things that we have to think about. Right? And some of them are obviously related to the whole question of technologies of the state. Uh, but the section that I'm moving to here is ideologies. Ideologies. Technology itself, by the way, is an ideology. And there are those who believe that technology will, res will resolve everything. So every problem created by technology can be resolved by technology. And that's an ideology in itself. It doesn't have the same salience in the 19th century that it's going to have in the 20th century. But here I'm interested in a number of other ideologies, each of which I'm going to look at very, very briefly. Um, the only one we're going to spend really some time on, because we've really uh, we've got to move to nationalism, of course, much later on, uh, is, uh, is uh, 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 the one I'm going to spend some time on is uh, socialism slash communism and the contributions of Marx. But, but let's begin very briefly with romanticism. And I have actually spoken to you about that before. Romanticism was the revolt against the ideology of the machine. The machine was soulless. Right? So you remember, you remember Wordsworth's poem, which I read out to you, uh, apropos the Industrial Revolution, how the Industrial Revolution had transformed England and transformed it, in, in, of course, from the point of view of the Romantics in, in ways that were really not desirable. It wasn't simply that the landscape had become ugly. It had become ugly. It was the fact that the moral landscape of the individual had become ugly. That this grind and dirt, which you could now see palpably on the buildings, the suit which you could see on the buildings, this suit had penetrated into the human soul. Right? That is the apt way to think about the romantic ideology. The notion that, that the child is innocent, for example, right? and, and what we call maturity, becoming mature, becoming an adult, is a way of actually being socialized into the evils of the world, so to speak. I'm giving it to you in a nutshell. Again, the, the caveat I keep on adding that uh, every you know half an hour that that all of these are obviously very complex movements and forms of thinking, but give you a sense, right, of what is really entailed. And and I wanted to show you one image here uh, from uh, one of my uh, one of the most magisterial figures in in world art and literature. And, and this is William Blake. So what you, what you see, and I don't know if anyone here knows this, uh, this uh, uh, work. This was first done in 1795. William Blake was an English poet, illustrator, uh, artist. Uh, in his own lifetime, he was largely ignored that that is the fate of many geniuses. Uh, uh, it was a much later on that he began to, begin, began to be celebrated. Uh, today, he's viewed as, uh, by some people, as possibly the greatest artist, uh, and certainly the most the, the English uh, writer who was most interested in the prophetic, the voice of prophecy. Right? Um, this is Blake's rendering of Newton. Newton. He had absolute disdain and contempt for Newton, Locke, and Galileo. Right? These 
major figures celebrated in the West today. Blake had absolute contempt for them. Why? Because so if you look his look at his annotation to this to this 1795, he does a, another version in 1805. So this is 1795 to 1805. There you see a naked Newton, and he's got a scroll there which he's kind of holding with his uh, in his mouth, rolled it down, and he's got a compass there, right? Um, and he adds an annotation to this painting. What does he say? Art is the tree of life. Science is a tree of death, right? He did not valorize science, which is what was, of course, happening in Europe at this point in time, uh, you know. And, and uh, Newton's theory of optics, in particular, was extremely offensive to Blake, who made a very clear distinction between what he called the vegetative eye. The vegetative eye is the eye with which we see things, we simply see. But of course, there are many ways of seeing. What is really being seen? Right? when we try to see something. How do we penetrate beyond what is simply there, the facade of it? And so he makes a distinction between what he calls his vegetative eye and spiritual vision, spiritual vision. That real vision has nothing to do with that, that they are blind, there are people who are blind and they see things in ways in which people who have good eyesight very often do not see at all. Right? So for him, science was this depth of life because it simply saw things on the surface. And again, I'm not interested here in entering into the, because the scientists among you here might be grumbling to yourself, you know, for good reasons, perhaps. Uh, but I'm not interested here in, in, in trying to suggest whether I agree with this or not. I, I'm simply trying to suggest to you that there is a romantic revolt, right? A romantic revolt in romanticism was uh, an ideology uh, uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, and. Uh, it cannot simply be dismissed in the manner in which I think many people would like to dismiss it, all right? So that, that's one, uh, but let me go back to that. So utilitarianism, an ideology that begins to emerge, you could say that, by the way, this is in some ways the predominant ideology uh, of the first half of the 19th century, um, and in many respects, uh, it continues to hold sway. Now, there is a very simple formula that is very often used. It's not a very productive formula in my view, uh, and some of you might have encountered it if you've ever read John Stuart Mill. So who are the people who are associated with utilitarianism? Uh, Jeremy Bentham, 1748 to 1832. This develops in England. Uh, the, other, the other two are James Mill, uh, the author of The History of British India, a huge six volume work. Uh, and his son, John Stuart Mill. You might recognize him, perhaps from a philosophy class in high school or from some anthology of the classics of Western literature. He's most well known for an essay called On Liberty, On Liberty. He was also, by the way, John Stuart Mill was also an ardent advocate of the rights of women. Um, he was married to Harriet, uh, 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 Harriet Mill Taylor, and, and she herself was a, uh, a considerable and well-known advocate of the rights of women. Uh, so, you know, they wrote essays uh, on the subjection of women and how the subjection of women had been achieved. Uh, and, and why it was a moral obligation on the part of every human being to think about the liberation of women. And so these are concerns that Mill has. But utilitarianism, what is that simple formula that I was alluding to? The greatest happiness of the greatest number. That's the, that's the cliched formula. Util, utilitarianism is a philosophical worldview which advocates that the that the policy that should be pursued is the one that is most conducive to producing the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So let's just translate this into, into plain English. This is plain enough, but let's translate it into plainer English. That if in a democratic society, you may have a number of different options that you want to pursue with respect to a certain social goal. Now utilitarianism will argue that the option which produces the greatest happiness for the greatest number. There may be 80 people in this room right now, we agree on one option, 50 of us, the remaining 30 do not. Well, the, the, the 50, their happiness outweighs, right? If I'm putting it in the most crudest terms, of course, produces 
their happiness, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. How do you measure the greatest happiness is, of course, another interesting problem here. Right? Now let me translate this yet into a different way for you to understand utilitarianism. So if you have a, a government that is dictated by utilitarian considerations, what considerations would be the most important for them? The most important would be to have a government that produces the best results with a minimum of government intervention. To that extent, I would say that every American ideology, every American administration, in fact, is utilitarian in its outlook. Right? So in, in India, for example, where utilitarianism became one of the, the formal, in some ways, the formal creed of the colonial state, in India, this meant that you try to produce a, a set of laws which are very clearly stated, the minimum number of laws stated in the clearest language. A government of good but few laws, a government with little taxation, and a government with little intervention. That would be really one way of translating the utilitarian freed. All right? All right, I think we're going to have to stop here. But I didn't get to radicalism, socialism, Marxism, but I obviously will in the beginning portion.